everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s, and today we're talking about xeriscaping and water-wise gardening. Also, just uh, drought-tolerant plants and drought gardening practices, I guess. Um, you may think that that's an odd thing um, for a Portland, Oregon garden center to be focusing on, uh, especially while we're still in May and um, it was lightly sprinkling this morning. But it's um, not only drought tolerant or gardening with less water or even what's commonly just referred to as water wise gardening is not only a combination of choosing select plants that have adaptations to use less water, but it's also some of the gardening practices that you implement as well to help uh, not only, you know, the plants in place reduce their water usage, but the overall water evaporation and kind of garden design uh, choices, which will help hold more water in your landscape, basically, and make all of your water choices um, and uses smarter. Water is a obviously decreasing uh, available resource for us no matter where you live. There are counties in, uh, I think at least 11 counties now in the state of Oregon that have declared uh, official drought status. And in many states, there's the same, um, several statewide drought uh, emergencies. And so we're all needing to make wiser choices in our landscape. And that doesn't mean that you're pulling out all of your plants um, and paving over everything. I mean, obviously going from one extreme to the opposite has its um, drawbacks and we wouldn't want to pave over our green spaces to see um, less permeability so then we would have less water runoff um, and you know gravel or pavement areas also radiate a lot of heat when it gets hot whereas at least um, gardens landscapes even lawns do um, kind of capture and and hold heat and cool gardens in many cases, not to mention tree cover, um, which is obviously what makes a big difference in cooling our landscapes and often neighborhoods. So xeriscaping is just a, um, a fancy word for dry gardening, basically. And it is, um, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a gardening style that includes the plants that you choose and the layout and layering effect of the garden, um, often also mass grouping plants together so that their needs are met easily. And then uh, often a mulch component that's either um, a bark or organic mulch, such as wood chips, hazelnut shells, um, or a gravel, um, decomposed granite, you know, crushed stone, pea gravel, that type of mulch as well. Any type of mulch is going to help hold in the moisture that you apply to your garden um, and reduce evaporation, as well as just act as usually a, um, an insulating layer. So help to just kind of regulate and cool temperature or prevent temperature spikes and um, drops in your garden. So we start with um, whether or not to amend your soil. And I know that, again, that highly depends on what you're planting and the condition of your soil itself. If you are going forward with um, a, a you know habitat garden or kind of the easy way of um, low maintenance gardening by choosing the native plant path, then I would suggest planting into your native soil. Um, if, however, your native soil has been scraped away, um, if you live in, you know, a house that's, I don't know, 10 years old or less, um, <clears throat> it was most likely kind of graded um, by the construction of your home. And a lot of that lovely topsoil has been scraped away. So it has left you with um, some kind of icky, yucky clay. Now, when we're talking about native 
drought tolerant plants. They don't want to sit in wet soil or um, poorly draining soil. So we do need to work that clay um, if it's that subsoil clay that's just so poorly draining that um, you know you dig a hole and fill it up and the water doesn't go anywhere all day. Uh, no, no plant really, unless it's like a bog plant, is going to be happy in those type of conditions. And that, again, is a different class. <clears throat> but that's, so like I mentioned, you don't have to go with strictly natives or um, choose like cactus and a gravel garden to call it xeriscaping. Here on my table today, running through the Lake Oswego Garden Center like I normally do, um, took me maybe 30 minutes to pull together this assortment of drought tolerant shrubs, perennials, grasses, natives, I have some natives here, as well as ground cover. <clears throat> I did not make the effort to drag in any trees today, so please forgive me, um, but trees are included on the list when we get to the plant list of um, drought tolerant pl uh, plants. So it's uh, amending your soil again, whether or not based on the soil conditions you have and what you're planting and it's kind of um, overall needs. If you again are um, working to reduce water usage in the long term, we want our plants to become kind of lean uh, and mean, so to speak, you know, so a little bit like self-sufficient, certainly not reliant on us in the long run, but that means that we've got to like raise them right in the early stages. So though they are tolerant of cold, hot, dry, sunny environments, drought tolerant plants still need water. Um, it's not a plant it and forget it type plant. There's really not a plant it and forget it type plant. Um, so it's basic gardening establishment is the same for our drought tolerant plants as it would be for non-drought tolerant plants. And that is for the first two years, specifically during the hotter, drier months, you need to provide a regular deep watering to the plantings and then give them chances to dry out a little, let the soil uh, dry out. The plants use some, some evaporates. When the soil dries out some, our, native, our uh, drought tolerant plants will seek water and usually the soil dries out from the top, right? So that causes our root system to penetrate deeper into the soil in search of the moisture that's down low. <clears throat> and so that deep watering and giving a few days off in between will allow us to train or so to speak encourage that deeper root system that becomes self-sufficient finding the lower water supply that is um, less likely to evaporate in the hot sun and warm soil. Now many people have sprinkler systems um, that are really designed to water lawn, um, to irrigate turf. They are either like the pop-up kind of just gentle rain type systems or um, maybe the like ch -ch 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 that kind of system. I know I'm a good sprinkler. Um, or maybe you drag your little 1970s like rainbow style portable sprinkler around. All of those are also great options, um, but when we see water thrown up in the air um, through any of these sprinkler type systems, we are definitely going to lose some of that water to evaporation, so that's one thing. Secondly, the watering that's necessary, the style of watering required for lawns and turf area is quite different from what we would consider a deep soak or a, um, a long deep watering that's needed for establishing trees, shrubs, and perennials uh, with a truly self-sufficient root system. So rather than 
uh, running your sprinklers, which are inefficient in the first place, either retrofitting your pop-up sprinklers with uh, a, a kit that's available in most cases, depending on your brand of sprinkler, it's a retrofit type kit that you can put down into the, uh, replace the sprinkle part, and that is drip tubing. So then you can add drip irrigation to your area from existing sprinkler type systems. And that drip tubing, running uh, a water supply through a tube connected to a small um, like controlled emitter that's placed right near the base of each plant is going to provide that uh, deep soaking, that drip, 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 um, that will go deep down into the soil, not creating a big flood or a puddle around the plant, but a deep soaking that will allow you to provide that thorough saturation of the root base <clears throat> and then skip a day or three days, uh, for example, in the um, irrigation zone in that zone so that the plants have a chance to seek out water on their own. Now, um, many people try to connect their irrigation all together if you have it and run, you know, your lawn sprinklers and then a, um, another area on shrubs and things. And that regular, like daily short spurts kind of thing, you know, runs for 15 minutes at 5 a.m. Um, that's almost the opposite than the the slow, deep watering that provides or encourages deep roots. That regular short watering can really encourage a shallow root system that is somewhat reliant or dependent on you um, always providing that regular supply of water. Uh, so that's an example, I guess, of how we can kind of train our landscape into um, being uh, more or less needy on us um, based off of how we water. And in reality, water is not cheap. So um, not only is it, you know, scarce and becoming scarcer, uh, but we pay a lot for it. Uh, and so making wise choices with it is just common sense. Now, um, there is a handout as always. It is attached to this video just below the description of the video. But as usual, if you cannot find it, please make a comment in the comment section and we will um, directly attach it to you so that you have access to it. The handout is um, listy as usual. So um, it does run through some of our kind of um, favorite and common and easy to access or easy to find um, tree shrubs, perennials, grasses, ground covers for drought tolerance. <clears throat> and just to stay on track, I'm always trying to refer to that. Um, so in addition to this kind of deeper root system that often our drought tolerant plants produce, which makes them drought tolerant, they have other interesting physical characteristics that they often share um, amongst one another that help them reduce their water usage or needs or help them store water so that when they do need it, they've got kind of a backup source. And the different plants here on my table show a lot of these different physical characteristics or adaptations. And I just wanna spend, um, I'm gonna watch the clock and try to spend like three minutes on it because I can go overboard on the physical characteristics of plants and how cool they are. And I just can't be taking too much time on that. So um, the leaf color that we see, often we have a blue gray, a silver gray um, foliage color. Here's a perfect example is blue fescue, a lovely drought tolerant grass that, you know, uh, you can really see how blue it is when you back it up against something shiny and green like this uh, Fatsia japonica, the Japanese aurelia. Now, uh, blue fescue, that powder blue color, which is usually a um, kind of a shared trait that you see in many, many Mediterranean plants. So um, extend that to over here, my lavender, excuse my reach guys. Um, so lavender, same lovely blue gray foliage and sort of a thin strappy leaf. Also blue gray drought tolerant perennial is our euphorbia. This is euphorbia wolfeni, same color. 
Over here, we get into the Russian sage, Perovskia, same steely blue, almost white stems. And again, here on the foliage and stems of our moonshine yarrow. So that blue-gray glaucus is the um, term for it. Oh, and, uh, you know, elephant in the room over here, cardoon. Really like dramatic big leaves that are blue gray or silver gray um, and the new growth is almost white. I'm going to handle that as little as I can because it's got spines and it's super pokey. Already got me once today. So blue gray, silver gray, sometimes even like hairy, fuzzy, soft. Think um, lamb's ears. Uh, we have another fun one that we love that is a tender perennial called Senecio Angel's Wings. Um, just petable. It feels like a puppy's ear. It is almost pure white and then covered in silky hairs that make it really fine. Um, so those are one. Now, red foliage is often another one. So here we've got Cotinus or Smokebush, that amazing purple, dark red foliage that's almost um, like a sunscreen for plants. So the red comes from... Um, anthocyanins which the plant pr uh, produces which are sort of like natural sunscreen you see again that same red color down here in our gora this is gora pink cloud a lovely drought tolerant perennial that i'll get back to <clears throat> and beyond red to like black here is our omphaloides or excuse me ophiopogon the jap or excuse black mondo grass so here that just dark so dark it's uh black in color showing you the the deep deep colors of plants that have some sun like sunscreen almost built into them uh thirdly obviously are succulent plants um and succulents give us that kind of chubby thick chubby leaves and a f like real fleshy <clears throat> uh habit so or whatever leaf stem etc this is Hands and Chicks, uh, one of our kind of most common, hardy, drought tolerant, ground cover type succulents. But we also have some more upright succulents that we'll look at and talk about. Succulents kind of hold extra water um, and can pull water out of their own leaves and stems when times are really tough and they are dry. <clears throat> so uh, that's what gives them that succulent nature is they store it in their leaves and stems. Shiny is another one. So shiny, we go back to uh, my wa my waxy friend here, Japanese Aurelia, Fatsia japonica, with this sheen on the leaves. So super shiny. Another shiny leaf that I have <clears throat> is on the California lilac, Ceanothus. So shiny leaves are basically a waxy coating that's over the kind of t tender, delicate leaf itself. And that waxy coating, again, provides um, a barrier that reduces moisture evaporation from the leaf. So they hold their moisture in just a little bit more efficiently than if they were like a matte sheen or a dull. Um, so the shiny leaves you often see or waxy coating on plants is another indication that it's adapted to drier conditions. Okay, enough about physical characteristics. <clears throat> The um, watering, so the schedule kind of of watering, and I, I want it, I know in a drought tolerant class, you wouldn't expect us to talk a lot about watering, but um, it is, as I mentioned, a critical factor in any garden, and getting the plants off to the right start uh, includes proper watering. So really, uh, newly planted trees and shrubs, you're going to need to give them you know, for the first two seasons, as I mentioned, uh, particularly during the hottest and driest part of the summer, a slow, deep watering that may be uh, twice a week, maybe three times a week as you um, see the plants, you know, establish their roots and become more self-sufficient, you can back off on your watering. And if at any time during, you know, the heat of a day um, or early in the morning in a hot summer, your plants are wilting, you know, and you have not watered, you want to make sure to alleviate that kind of stress on them by making, you know, giving them water. So, you know, don't just be like, mm, I don't know, guys, you should be drought tolerant. I'm not watering you. Um, wilting is, is stressful on plants. So 
We wanna give them the water that they need. It's just that, um, again, we also wanna back off and give them some kind of space in between watering. That also includes the third and the fourth year. Um, we're gonna water them every few weeks, kind of keep a watchful eye during the heat of the summer, the hottest, driest months. And by, you know, beyond that, even mature trees and shrubs and, and perennials are gonna benefit from a deep watering every three or four weeks. Um, so that is, again, you know, a nice deep soaking, whether that's a good solid rain that we get or your you know, supplemental water of that space or of those mature plantings once a month or every three weeks or so. That can make the difference in, um, again, sort of a landscape that is surviving, but is like on the border of maybe stress to a landscape that is thrifty with water usage still uses far less than you know a lawn area would for example but may still be able to give you a nice display of um, you know good sized leaves luscious flowers um, and kind of you know that staying power that you would get instead of a, a landscape that kind of peters out by the mid or late summer so supplemental watering and mulch uh, watering and mulch now mulch can be as I mentioned, uh, depending on your garden areas, mulch can be of a different material. Um, here, if you wanted to buy it, out, buy it out of a bag, the G&B Soil Building Conditioner, which helps to break up clay soil, is also an excellent top dressing or mulch. It is organic and dark. It kind of looks like a cross between soil and shredded bark, and it's light and fluffy. It's about, um, let's see, studies have, be done, have been done with mulch, really no matter what type of material you use, a three inch thick layer of mulch reduces your water evaporation from the soil by 30%. So um, that makes a significant difference in what, like I said, is lost back up into the atmosphere once you've paid for and taken the time to put it down into the soil. Shredded bark, as I mentioned, is another nice and fine mulch op, uh, alternative. A lot of people use that for more cosmetic looks. Um, it may or may not be more effective on weed control than like the GMB soil conditioner is, which is kind of a rich, nutritious base. Weed seeds can land in that and easily sprout, but it's also loose and fluffy, so they're easy to remove. Arborists' wood chips are becoming another very popular uh, mulch material um the i don't mean shredded bark again but like chunky woody debris that is um from the the chipper after an arborist has cut down a tree and um that is a neat kind of um shortcut to get that raw material directly from the arborists to the gardeners and instead of having the arborists bring it to you know a a landscape yard debris you know supply uh, and so chip drop is a um, one of those type of uh, organizations out there that i think is pretty national i don't really know but here in portland we use chip drop um, but always be prepared for a giant pile because you can't usually predict when it's going to come or how much you're going to get um, so when it rains, it pours um, on free, uh, free items. Um, so again, be prepared for that. In my vegetable garden, I mulch with straw. Um, so I get organic, just um, seed-free straw. And I find that a big thick layer of straw in my vegetable garden is easy for me to move. It's inexpensive. And I'm just looking to hold water in. I don't really need the cosmetic um, you know, look that I would want from something maybe darker or more, um, I don't know, prettier. And then the straw, I can easily kind of move away when I need to plant or replant an area and replace it a lot easier than like shredded bark or whatever, which is hard to remove. You usually end up reapplying it if you um, plant or, you know, over time bark decomposes, you need to reapply. Now, and again, there's gravel, all kinds of gravel, which 
has its pros and cons, obviously, but acts as a great mulch. <coughs> Excuse me. When we, uh, I kind of allude to the design, your kind of overall design of a drought tolerant garden, not only will you find um, that it's, well, I think that the plants I pulled together on this table look all really nice together. So it's not difficult to pull together a good looking landscape because of some of those shared physical characteristics of the plants. So you can end up kind of repeating that, you know, blue gray or that burgundy effect throughout the landscape or a shiny leaf, for example, um, which make these kind of bold landscape statements that help you um, unite the whole garden and create more of that designed look and effect. So um, not only do they all look pretty good together because of those shared characteristics, <clears throat> but it's also important to, if you're not gonna use a lot of mulch and hardscape in your, in your garden, to be, to plant somewhat intensely. So, so using layers of trees, shrubs, an understory of perennials and then ground cover will give you a kind of full dense planting that ends up creating something of what we would call a living mulch. So having plants growing, not crowded, but close together as they fill out into their mature sizes will keep their keep them from having just like vacant space between them vacant space is where the sun's going to shine down and really cook the soil and evaporate the water um, so that's one moisture loss space where the foliage and kind of fullness of a garden will help to reduce that uh, but vacant space is also where nature just decides to grow some weeds anyways um, so planting a little bit more densely is a technique that can help with that living mulch kind of effect. And then you don't need to use so much mulchy mulch um, because the plants are doing it themselves. Now, as I mentioned, wherever possible and when suitable, selecting appropriately sited native plantings uh, can be a low maintenance, um, hugely beneficial direction to go and a great choice to make. Not only are you then providing for habitat, um, you know, birds, insects, wildlife in general, but you are also then choosing plants that have become over the long, long history adapted to our climate, our soil, our kind of varying weather conditions and the very space that you're growing in. Portland Plant List, if you're in Portland, has um, a lot of eco-regions that they've identified with specific plants that <coughs> grow together in communities that make it easy again to kind of start pulling together a list of native plants, native plantings that have a cohesive look and grow as a community and all thrive together in similar conditions. So preparing ahead, <clears throat> whether it is native plants that you're choosing or whether you just are planning it out for your um, either layered effect or your kind of more sparse, you know, clumping of desert scaping, whatever it is that, you know, is, is what you're, whatever you're going for. Studying and thinking through the plant selection is the first place to start. At most of our garden centers, you will find that, uh, at least in the perennial departments, we have uh, tables that are laid out by theme or by kind of usage or what you would want. And so we have an entire section or table that is devoted to drought tolerant and water wise plants. Throughout the rest of the garden center, most of the um, water wise plants are kind of snuck in amongst the water 
regular water using plants and so it's not quite as easy when you get into the trees and shrubs but again that's where you can come along with your handy dandy list or always ask a salesperson um, who can help you make the right choices so trees as i did not bring in um madrones which are one of our native trees madrones as i put on the list they are uncommon in retail markets they are um somewhat difficult to like transplant and establish but if you have a property and you have a madrone don't ever cut it down because you'll never replace it and they're beautiful trees and they're wonderfully drought tolerant they're related to manzanitas they have that like sh smooth shiny kind of coppery red bark um big evergreen uh waxy green leaves and um, just truly a, a stunning tree as they get large. So Arbutus, uh, if you have one, you're lucky and they're native. Western Redbud, Eastern Redbud, Incense Cedar and Deodor Cedar, Ponderosa Pine, uh, Eucalyptus, another one that's <clears throat> hard to find, <coughs> excuse me, hard to find on the retail market. Um, figs, believe it or not, are edible figs. They do great as drought tolerant plants, especially when you're looking for um, drought tolerant edibles, artichokes, figs, right there, there's two. Cypress, uh, things in the cypress family, spruce and the spruce family, silk tree, the mimosa, sometimes people also call them, Japanese zelkova, and sweet bay or our laurel, um, Loris nobilis, the culinary bay, which makes a fast growing kind of shrub slash tree. When we get to shrubs, um, again, I find a lot of these shrubs are shrub slash trees in the first place. So many of them do grow at a fairly good size. <clears throat> and one of them is this smoke bush. So sometimes we call it smoke tree, sometimes we call it smoke bush. Um, as I mentioned, that beautiful burgundy foliage, which tends to hold on this variety, this is royal purple, I believe. And so the, the color stays on the foliage year round, not year round, but spring through summer, drops its leaves in the winter. Whereas there are green forms of smoke bush as well that are equally drought tolerant. Um, one is uh, called Grace. California, f oh, compact strawberry bush over here. Another kind of related to Manzanita um, and Madrone is the Arbutus Unido Compacta. Compact strawberry bush here is kind of over in my jungle. Let me grab it just for a minute. It's a lovely, fast growing, evergreen, ends up with that kind of peely, uh, shaggy bark that can be sort of reddish or reddish orange. Little white or pink urn shaped flowers that hang in clusters that pollinators love. So your little bees will go in there. And then those flowers um, develop into this funky, reddish orange fruit that sort of resembles a, like a perfectly round strawberry. Good sized, even though it's compacta in the name. So you're looking at like six to eight feet tall and wide. And like I said, fairly fast growing, even up to 10 by 10 um, if you don't prune it at all. But a wonderful, wonderful plant um, that eventually really doesn't really want much summer watering. Um, and that goes also with the actual manzanita um, which uh, we carry some varieties of, but there's a lot of really cool native varieties of manzanita and ornamental varieties of manzanita. And many of those, once they're established, um, want like no supplemental water in the summer. So um, as I mentioned, the kind of water savvy, water wise nature of most native plants, or excuse me, of most drought tolerant plants they're also often sensitive to overwatering or perpetually wet or soggy soil. And so that like, oh, I'll just set the sprinklers for 10 minutes a day, um, that overwatering, keeping them constantly wet can quickly le lead to root rot on a plant that is holding and storing water um, and used to uh, saving up for um, the dry times. So they're sensitive to root rot for sure. And root rot early on is a horrible, uh, plays a horrible trick 
on gardeners. Root rot's early appearance is of the plant wilting. So the first thing you see is the same look of a wilting plant. It's going to start drooping or sagging. And if you don't connect with the fact that it's already soaking wet or that you've recently watered it, or no matter how much you water it, it doesn't perk back up, you just keep watering. And as you keep watering the plant, you are making the problem worse. And root rot is very hard to recover from. So um, that's just a you know cautionary word on the drought tolerant plants and their sensitivity. Crepe myrtle, another great uh, I didn't bring any in today, but they'll be coming in as they kind of wake up their, my crepe myrtle is like barely got an inch of foliage on it this uh, time of year. So they're late sleepers. They wake up a little bit late in the season, but they <clears throat> are used in like Sacramento, California as street trees. So uh, surrounded by concrete and windows and cars, um, they can take it hot and dry and um, they're really built for that. Uh, California wax myrtle or organ myrtle, the Umbelaria California, Californica, also known as Mirica Californica, and I think even more recently reclassified as like Morris or Morel Morelia. I can't keep up with you taxonomists. Um, a wonderful native, Pacific what, Northwest native, like a great hedge alternative. Um, just a kind of thin, waxy, again, waxy leaf. Um, nice evergreen to like 10 to 30 feet, whether it's in sun or shade. It is, um, again, great kind of dense thicket for uh, habitat as well. So the uh, wax myrtle is lovely for that. Rock rose, I think I brought in a rock rose today. Rock rose is like a little shrub over here that gives us a lovely, lovely flower that looks a lot like a rose. And it's gonna be blooming um, pretty much like May, uh, late spring and then early summer. So May and June, or maybe June and July this year. Um, this is an evergreen shrub. It's uh, easy care, fairly fast growing and can get like five by five or even taller. So um, like you buy it right now in this tiny little thing and you think, oh, it's just a tiny little thing. This will become a good size shrub. Um, five by eight, uh, five to eight tall by four to six wide. So it's like literally as tall as I am or more um, and as wide as I am or more. So, um, and beautiful covered with large white flowers in late spring to early summer. Rock rose, very lovely drought tolerant. I think I've got more here in front. Uh, Barberry, California lilac. Okay, yes. <clears throat> California lilacs, everyone's kind of favorite when it comes into bloom, and then we sort of forget about it. But I can't blame anyone. Um, it's just about to bloom, which is a little late this year. I showed this as a shiny, shiny leaf, but it also has this like vibrant blue purple flower that is just about to pop. Uh, when it blooms, it's covered in flowers. And of course, um, when the flowers are open, they're also um, lightly fragrant and covered by bees. So um, pollinators and bees love the California lilac. This is another fast grower that ends up at eight to 10 feet tall and wide, nine to 12 even perhaps. And so at 12 or 10 feet, it's almost like a tree. Same with our smoke bush, um, same with even, uh, what did I just show? The rock rose. The rock rose is just more rounded though, so it's gonna stay rounded. Smoke bush, California lilac, could actually be kind of arborized over time. Um, and that means that you could prune them as they grow to limb up the bottom and sort of raise the lower level of branches so that you expose a little bit of a trunk and have just sort of a tree shape on the on the plant which would give you room for that lower layer or under planting um, and kind of emphasize again something a little bit more tree-like in your landscape uh, instead of just a, a big mound or a big bush. The um, 
juniper family. I mean, they are like workhorses in the garden. They're evergreen. They're extremely drought tolerant. And they come in a couple of different, you know, forms and shapes. Um, and it's not always like the juniper from the 70s. Um, so this is kind of juniper from the 70s. This is blue rug. But look at that cool blue texture. Fun hanging over stone walls or retaining walls. Um, even great in a pot or a container and still very drought tolerant. Super, super, super hardy. Negative something or other um, for sure. And then this is juniper, juniperus compressa. Uh, this is a variety called Berkshire. And Berkshire is more of a um, like foot tall, foot and a half wide, full sun to part shade, just a frosted green with like a hint of that powder blue. Juniper, uh, this rug juniper is soft, but a lot of juniper are pokey. So um, not like the favorite thing that you're gonna be like brushing up against or sitting next to, um, but fantastic, you know, far out into the sunny spots in your area where um, the, you know, hose doesn't reach and it's hard to run irrigation to, that kind of stuff, great for juniper. But juniper is nowhere near as pokey as barberry. <clears throat> and then as I mentioned, cardoon, which has great big spikes on it. But barberry is another one of those um, work horse plants. It is, um, it's covered in spikes which provide um, a lot of controversy, I would say, in um, whether or not they're worth planting in the garden. I suppose uh, if it made roses, people wouldn't complain nearly as much about the spikes that it has, but they, they'll poke you, they'll scratch you. You have to put on your battle gear to go work out with the barberry or for planting, you need some gloves. But the foliage color that we get from Barberry, this happens to be Golden Rocket. Yes, Golden Rocket. Um, but there's Rose Glow, which it goes back to that beautiful burgundy color of the smoke bush. Um, Barberry have the color of foliage that is really wonderful in contrast to um, the standard greens and blue greens in the garden. Unfortunately, most of the very colorful leaf barberries are deciduous, which means that they go to bare branches in the fall. But uh, in the process of like their summer growth, they make a tiny little berry, um, like a little fruit. And so the once they drop all their leaves, the berry is just a lovely little uh, accent that becomes much more noticeable as it is bare. And it's a full plant, so it's kind of um, still gives you some density and a good barrier at the time, even when it's uh, leafless. So barberry come in a lot of different forms. Um, birds love to hang out in barberry, but like I said, you've got to be prepared to work with it because it can be on the scratchy, pokey, nasty side, but that also makes it mean and lean for the, for the drought tolerant landscape. <clears throat> At the garden center, and if you took a barberry home, for example, and that's an interesting uh, thing to, I guess, take note of, because a lot of these drought tolerant plants rely on a deep root system to be drought tolerant in their containers, in their pots, um, sometimes they can be total wimps. They need to make a big deep root system in order to be like good and self-sufficient on their own. And so we've got to make sure that we don't let the barberry dry out in the garden center. And you would too, if you took one home and let's say kept it in a pot for a week and didn't plant it, you've got to make sure to keep that plant watered until you can get it in the ground and then that root system can grow because it can't do it in a pot. Um, so sometimes the very hardiest in the ground um, are like the wimpiest, neediest in the pot. So, um, but there's a reason why. <clears throat> uh, rosemary, lavender, again, awesome, drought tolerant, uh, evergreen. And then lavender and rosemary, you get the bonus of their culinary usage, whether that's um, lavender for potpourri or lavender lemonade, and then rosemary, all the things you can do with rosemary. 
Uh, and then over here, one of my other little conifer friends, it's so cute right now putting out brand new growth, is uh, this is an upright U. Y-E-W is U. Uh, Taxus. This cat happens to be a Taxus baccata. This is Stanchii. And Stanchii is a golden Irish U. So the new growth that comes out is just this like brand new chartreuse puff. And then over time, it's going to age to this more mature green, dark, dark green. You are, you are drought tolerant. Uh, you are tolerant of sun and quite a bit of shade. They are also deer resistant, rabbit resistant, um, and fairly slow growing. Um, but they're also like the, every part of the yew plant is toxic as well. So it can produce a berry, some varieties, toxic. The leaves, the foliage, toxic if you ingest it. Um, again, just a good thing to know. Tons of plants are toxic, but yews are like highly toxic. Um, so don't eat them. When we get to perennials, again, we've got awesome native perennials to choose from. I did grab this penstemon, which is almost in bloom, but this is the fine-toothed penstemon. Uh, this is penstemon subsiratus. I have seen this one out in the wild, as well as um, tons of other native penstemons that we have growing kind of um, rocky outcrops, uh, sunny, like high uh, open woodland areas or clearings in the forest. Um, then you see these gorgeous penstemon blooming. The flowers can come in a range of colors, but this happens to be electric blue. Um, not only is that the color, but that's the name of this variety. So this is electric blue penstemon. <clears throat> Wonderful uh, summer blooming, most like June, uh, drought tolerant perennial. Uh, yarrow, as I mentioned, yarrow here comes in a range of colors, but uh, we also have a native yarrow for the Pacific Northwest that blooms white, very drought tolerant. And yarrow has a lot of other just wonderful aspects to it. It attracts uh, native, excuse me, attracts beneficial insects to your garden and is a um, nectar source for uh, butterflies as well. So a great butterfly plant. Speaking of that, butterfly weed or Asclepius, um, we do have some of that in stock here at the Lake Oswego Garden Center. Another great drought tolerant kind of, you know, fares fine on its own type plant. <clears throat> See Ollie blanket flower, which is Gallardia here, just starting to bloom with its little pinwheel of um, just orange fluff. Uh, comes in a couple of different flower forms and colors, but Gallardia, there is also a native blanket flower to the Northwest. Um, this happens to be an ornamental form, but long blooming, easy care and drought tolerant. Uh, Gallardia are also deer and rabbit resistant. Coneflower or uh, echinacea, um, didn't bring any of that in. Red hot poker, Russian sage, I showed Russian sage for a minute. Um, so not only Russian sage is a great example of that powder blue or kind of blue gray foliage, but Russian sage makes a um, similar like steely blue flower that is late summer into fall. Um, the standard size Russian sage is a large plant. So again, a perennial that can grow to five by five easily. Um, but now there are forms that are dwarf. This happens to be a uh, little, little something, um, little spire, um, which is like three to four. Uh, no, only two feet tall. So a nice dwarf version of that great big sage. Uh, J Russian sage, Jerusalem sage, another fun one, Flomus fruticosa, great big pattern leaves right now, which are going to bloom in the later summer with a yellow, kind of a funky yellow flower that comes in whirls on top, tracks butterflies and is evergreen. We talked about the um, wonderful euphorbias. These are wallflowers. Wallflowers are also evergreen, long blooming, drought tolerant, easy care. This one is also fragrant. Um, so this happens to be 
uh, winter passion. And so even though it's winter passion, it's still blooming. They're deer resistant to boot. So what is that? Uh, evergreen, drought tolerant, fragrant, deer resistant. They make a good cut flower. They just don't have the longest stem. I mean, gosh, they're not edible. Um, that's maybe one criteria that people often have, uh, but they hit a lot of other uh, really high uh, qualities. Wallflower, erysimum. Looked at our penstemon, gora. I don't think I have gora on the list. California fuchsia verbena, tixie, tixie, uh, cape fuchsia I have on the list. Then we'll go by the things that I'm ad-libbing on. Cape fuchsia is this glorious tall one. And I've got a smaller version of a cape fuchsia here. Uh, this one is called deep rose, duh. Um, deep rose, a little bit of a compact form, up to two feet tall, about two feet wide. Hummingbirds go bonkers over all of the Cape fuchsias, and they are late, long blooming for full sun or part shade and super drought tolerant. They are perennials, so they die back in the winter and return in the spring. Very hardy, zero to ten. Um, and then this is Winchester Fanfare, which is one of our larger, you know, so three feet tall, three feet wide, just starting to bloom uh, and will be a long bloomer into late summer, even early fall. Herbaceous perennial, so it dies back in the wintertime. Hummingbirds love. These are not fuchsia fuchsias. So cape, like Superman wears a cape. Cape fuchsias, also known as phygelius, but with a P. They're tricky little plants, but they're super rewarding. Um, and again, very drought tolerant, um, full sun part shade hummingbirds. Not on the list. Gora, which I showed just a little bit of. Gora is such a fun perennial. Easy care, long blooming. You're not going to really cut the flowers of Gora. Every time I cut the flowers, they just shatter off of the stem and make a mess. But I love to just look at them out in the garden. They're like a kind of haze of flower color and bloom from now till frost. This is whirling butterflies, which is a good sized, again, two and a half, three feet tall plant by about three feet wide. Blooms till frost, then frost kills it back. Then it's kind of stems I cut back in early spring, and then it just does it all over again every season. And Gora also has a darker leafed form. Uh, this happens to be Pink Cloud, but there are a couple of different versions of the darker leafed Gora, and they also tend to have a darker uh, flower. So this is kind of a cherry pink bloom on Pink Cloud, um, but a little bit more pizzazz from the foliage at the same time. For shady spots, I've got a fabulous dry shade perennial slash ground cover. This is Epimedium, also known as Bishop's Hat. Uh, Epimedium is, uh, we see the bloom, a little bit of bloom left on this particular one, but there's a wide range of Epimedium, both kind of leaf shape and color, flower shape and color. Some are evergreen, some die back in the winter. Most of them bloom like late winter, early spring as well um, and can kind of go along with hellebores, which also tend to be fairly drought tolerant. We just don't have any in stock right now. <clears throat> and when we get to, oh gosh, last week we talked about peonies. Yeah, last week we talked about peonies. And uh, when it comes to peonies, as I mentioned, also quite drought tolerant once they're established. That's what makes them one of those kind of beloved, you know, thrifty uh, farmhouse and country type old fashioned flower. The Ito peony that we were looking at last week, well, I don't think this is the one that we were looking at, but look at her now. So this is Keiko, I think it was. Um, I'll tell you whether or not it is. Uh, it's up here. Keiko, yes. So that's Keiko here. And then, all right, Becky, you really should just zoom in on this thing. This is Red Charm. And this is a peony that just popped for us today. It's um, mesmerizing in its fluffy red center. 
and this just like again like waxy thick waxy shiny deep red petal and we have giant flower buds that are this is what we call popping color so it is just cracked color and is has a little bit of the sticky stuff left on it that is going to be eaten away by ants today as the flower slowly unfurls in hopefully the next couple of days of sunny weather. We'll see what we get. Um, but peonies, lovely, drought tolerant, and a good example of the fact that you don't have to like skimp or go with, um, you know, scruffy, rough looking plants to be considered drought tolerant or to make drought tolerant choices. Um, Ground cut, oh, ornamental grasses. I showed you off our lovely blue fescue, evergreen or never green, it's blue instead, but it's always there through the winter so it doesn't die back in the winter months. But another really popular and well-loved grass that does die back, this is uh, Carl Forrester, also known as feather reed grass. Carl Forrester, Calamagrostis, is a upright kind of narrow growing grass, so it makes a great um, summer screen or kind of accent plant without taking up a lot of um, horizontal space and um, wonderfully drought tolerant in full sun or even part shade. Another evergreen or like I said never green uh, grass for part shade or even shade this is the black mondo grass. Um, in hot sun, black mondo grass can kind of bleach out and turn sort of brownish. So it does have this like richest color in uh, filtered sun or even a little bit of shade. Um, wonderfully drought tolerant once established. And I will confess it's not a true grass. And I know that, but we use it like a grass. So it always ends up um, in association with grasses on lists. <clears throat> and when we get to ground covers, um, I showed our wonderful creeping Mahonia, the low growing form of Oregon grape. This is Mahonia repens, one of my favorites. Um, just really well behaved, about a foot and a half tall, maybe three feet wide, wonderfully evergreen, uh, early spring or late winter, bright yellow flower that is a uh, pollinator and hummingbird attracting, drought tolerant, deer and rabbit resistant, all the goods native as I mentioned. Stone crop and succulents, um, they're again kind of like I said a whole class of their own. Um, they develop that thick fleshy leaf that holds moisture. We looked at the hens and chicks but here we have an example not only, so this is Sedum Cape Blanco which is a Northwest native again it is, it has everything, um, like almost all of the characteristics that we've talked about. Silver gray or gray blue or whatever you want to call it, it's almost white. It is also kind of low, uh, low profile. It's fleshy and thick in its leaves and its stem storing water um, when it needs it. It can pull it from its own stems. Similarly, another Pacific Northwest native. This though is a hybrid of a native. Uh, this is Louisia, named after Lewis of the Lewis and Clark expedition. It is uh, another like waxy and fleshy rosette of leaves that are somewhat succulent. And then it's like, what? Look at these flowers. Um, so butterflies, hummingbirds, pollinators, everybody is mesmerized by these beautiful flowers. They come in a range of colors. There's a Louisia Columbiana that is more of a um, slightly larger bloom. Uh, this is Louisia Cotyledon, I believe. Um, and then this is Elise Mix. So you'll see a range of the Louisia and um, some that are more specific for the true native selection if you're looking for that as well. But I just think that's such a charming display. They need excellent drainage, like really, really well draining soil. They're used to growing like on rocks and rocky outcroppings. So another one that like if you put it into dirty dirt or even like clay based dirt, um, watch your drainage, maybe add a lot of sand or even potentially plant them in um, like pots or 
um, troughs or that kind of thing to use as accents in your um, landscape. Succulents. Oh, another one that does like everything that we were talking about as well. This is Sedum Sun Sparkler Plum Dazzled. And Plum Dazzled has that purple burgundy leaf, also thick, fleshy, succulent foliage um, that gives us that wonderful um, kind of sunscreen and sun resistance. This is a herbaceous perennial though, so it melts down to nothing in the winter time, gets a foot tall and a foot wide and blooms in the late summer, uh, in addition to this pretty color that we have. <clears throat> More ground covery, ground cover, times, times make an excellent final layer in the garden to um, be again that living mulch or ground cover that helps to reduce soil uh, water evaporation. Thymes are evergreen um, and fragrant just like culinary thymes are so when you do walk on them um, they release a nice fragrance. They have a small flower that is also attractive and beneficial to pollinators and as I mentioned um, you can walk on them so time takes uh, moderate foot traffic and is also deer and rabbit resistant. So um, lots going for time. But any of the ground cover that's really tightly matted like this is going to be a little bit slower to like completely fill in a space um, because it's so matted and collected. So it takes a little bit longer or plant a little bit closer together for times to fill in solidly. Whereas a looser, um, faster growing ground cover. This is Rubus um, Emerald Carpet. Rubus, you can see, you know, is just spreading in all directions and is going to fill a space much faster than uh, the time is. But Rubus <clears throat> also gets a bit taller and is a little bit woodier and not quite as friendly to go walking through, um, maybe occasional. And even then you might damage or break a couple of stems as you did it. So you'd want to reduce uh, walking. But evergreen, um, drought tolerant, sturdy, can actually act as a good erosion control. So um, rubus will root back down into the soil on its little stems as they extend. And if you are following along and you have some um, botanical lexicon in your background. Rubus is the name that is also used in raspberries. So this is a type of raspberry. Um, it does make a little flower that kind of looks like a berry flower and then it makes a um, orange, kind of reddish orange, small raspberry um, that's edible. But man, it is the seediest raspberry you have ever eaten. Um, so you eat one and you will, like try to spit the seeds out for the next 20 minutes and that pretty much stops you from eating the rest of them. But birds, birds like them. Um, so there's something for habitat and critters. Two, three, more. One is in the middle here, Kinnick Kinnick. One of my favorite botanical names. Uh, Kinnick Kinnick's botanical name is Arctostaphylos uva ursi. It's got a lot going on there. Um, uva ursi is hyphenated, so I don't know if uva meant ursi uh, sometime and they got married but wouldn't blend their names or what that actually means. Um, but Arctostaphylos uva ursi kinnick kinnick, both their names are really fun. This is a native, this is evergreen, super drought tolerant, um, grows in sun to filtered shade, uh, again deer, rabbit resistant, um, a wonderful, not like I wouldn't do it as a walking type ground cover, it's not exactly steppable. Um, but other than that, even erosion control, so it does great on banks and slopes. And two more, uh, this is, this is a, a, an, a, an adorable plant. You see the characteristics that it's showing you, that blue-gray, again, very low profile. This is pink pussy toes. Um, you see this often as like either beach growing or alpine, like above the tree line. Um, when it does bloom, its flowers are adorable. Um, and unfortunately, I can't really show them to you, but just think about the like beans, right? Little cat beans. They look like pink pussy toes. Uh, so the undersides of little cats, they're little tiny foot pads. Um, the flowers, that's, that's what they look like. So right, adorable. Then, done. 
evergreen, alpine, easy care, drought tolerant. Um, and then the last one that is cooler than cool, it's not, it's not blue gray, it's green, but it's waxy. Um, and it's also like, it looks like moss, right? It looks all like, Ooh, I want to go lay around in that. It's hard, like a pine cone almost. So this is stiff, firm, evergreen, low mat ground cover. And it's just now showing it's like tiny little buttons of chartreuse. Uh, this is called green cushion bolax, B-O-L-A-X, like Lorax, but bolax. Bolax, there's like, it's, I don't know if there's other members of its family, but it's, um, this is one of the only ones that we normally see. I don't know where it is. It feels like plastic. It totally feels like AstroTurf. That's what it feels like. Um, as I mentioned, evergreen, sun part shade, tiny, two inches at the most, spreads to six inches. Not the fastest grower, but decent. Um, and definitely takes like light foot traffic. Um, so there you have it. You should come and feel it because it's really weird. And with that, I'm going to say that I have covered most of the plants that I brought in, which I was not sure I was going to get to today. So um, hopefully that gives you some inspiration to go looking at your landscape differently, finding plants for uh, perhaps that you identify in your garden as being extra water needy and either removing them or consolidating the plants that need the most moisture into one common space that you can add irrigation or water more consistently to slowly transition more and more of your landscape into uh, plants and plant techniques that use less water or use the water wisely. Uh, and with that, thanks as always for tuning in. Happy garden.